Okay, so maybe we'll get going. Sure. And um, yes, yeah, so we're going to carry on the story uh, from where we got to last time. Uh, we started looking at how uh, the original single Muslim empire broke up into different states and how uh, uh, some of those were Sunni, some were Shia. We talked about developments uh, about the Abbasid dynasty that lasted till about 1250 in Baghdad, which was a real golden age of, of uh, um, all sorts of learning with a, a university type institution. And we saw how that actually also influenced Jewish culture, that the two great yeshivas of the day moved to Baghdad because it was the center. So we talked a little bit about the, the progression of the expansion. And that we'll start off today talking about what about non-Muslims who were living in these areas? Because having very rapidly, uh, and then somewhat more slowly in the centuries that followed, um, taking control in so many different places, the Muslims had to consider how to deal with the non-Muslim majority under their rule. And as we said earlier on, uh, conversion to Islam was quite slow at the beginning. First of all, um, the Arabs, as they invaded uh, different areas uh, that had been the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire, weren't too sure that uh, Islam was a religion for everyone. They saw it very much as an Arab religion. But gradually ideas on that change and gradually it became more possible to join. And we did see that over the centuries, slowly populations begin changing because clearly if you wanted high office you were going to have to be Muslim because uh, non-Muslims were not going to get that. Um, it wasn't the, the beginning there was a certain second class status even to Muslim converts they were still regarded as not quite fully Muslim uh, at the very very beginning but gradually over time that attitude changed to a certain extent too. But even when we're talking about the, the Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, uh, the majority of the population in most of these places were still not Muslim at all. So policies had to be evolved about how they were to be treated. And there was a collective term for people who weren't Muslim, who were ro ruled by Muslim, that term is dhimmi, uh, and it comes from an Arabic word, dhimma, which means protection or pact of protection. And at first, the term was only applied to people designated as people of the book, al al kitab, uh, which meant Jews and Christians, uh, possibly Majans. Uh, later on, it was extended to different peoples under Muslim rule, like Sikhs, Buddhists, Zoroastrian, and in certain times and places, even to Hindus. Uh, the, the term dhimmi has a sort of implication of the state's obligation to protect these people including the individual's life, property, and freedom of religion and worship. But in return, it also required loyalty to the ruling empire or government of the particular locality, and also the payment of a poll tax known as the jizya. Uh, Muslims also had to pay tax, so it wasn't as though uh, the dhimmi were the only people paying tax. Um, it was by this stage, by the high Middle Ages, it was much, much easier to convert to Islam, but it was rarely forced on the dhimmi, uh, there were sporadic times and places where there was forced conversion, but they tended to be uh, somewhat unusual. So examples of forced conversions include the Almohad period in Spain and the Maghreb, North Africa, in the late 12th century. And uh, this accounts for some of the vagaries of Maimonides' life. He was fleeing the Almohad, so weirdly he left Spain and went to North Africa, which was their heartland never quite understood that. Uh, there are suggestions that Rabbam himself was forcibly converted, or at least, uh, you know, externally converted at one stage. Uh, some people uh, think that happened, and certainly it's happened to many other people. Uh, quite often people would uh, say they had converted to Islam and hang on till the things got a bit better and then come out again rather quietly as Jews. So that was not unusual. Uh, the 14th century in Baghdad, there was an episode. Uh, 16th century in Libya, uh, late uh, 19th century in Iran, particularly the, the city of Mashhad, where all the Jews, I think, were forced to convert, um, and early 20th century Yemen. But though these uh, episodes did occur, they weren't majority policy. They tended to be at particular times at particular places, obviously not pleasant when they happened. But it wasn't a general policy that every non-Muslim living under Muslim rule had to be forced to convert. And there were two verses of the Quran that were of particular importance for determining how the dhimmi were treated. I'm going to share the screen, I hope. Yes, there we are. Okay, so the first verse is particularly famous. This is in the second chapter of the Quran, verse 256. There is no compulsion in religion. This one is very, very often cited by 
liberal Muslims today. The right direction is henceforth distinct from error, and he who rejects false deities and believes in God has grasped a firm handhold which will never break. God is hearer, knower. So that's, you could say, the tolerance verse. There is also, however, in the ninth chapter of the Quran, there is this verse. Fight those who believe not in God, nor the last day, and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden. Such men as do not practice the religion of truth, being of those who have been given the book, in other words, they are Christian or Jewish, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and are sighirun. Now, the jizya, we know what that is, that's the full text. Uh, sighirun has been much debated. It literally means small or little. So there is uh, considerable commentary on what that might actually mean. So the first of the verses, there is no compulsion in religion, um, implied that everyone could practice their religion. The second verse, the uh, first uh, from chapter nine, implies that non-Muslims, even if they are people of the book, should pay the poll tax and be maybe subjugated or made small or humiliated in some way. Um, not that they should be forced to change their religion, you know, but certainly that they should pay jizya and then this much disputed status of sarir. Now, different ways and different times, people interpreted that word differently. It was usually given a fairly non-specific interpretation early on, but the 11th century Islamic commentators, writing at a time when Islam was threatened by the Crusaders uh, and the Mongols in two different directions, and we'll talk about that later, tended to read the verse as commanding humiliation of the Mies, especially when they were paying their tax. And there were various ceremonies, again, in particular, uh, areas at particular times where uh, non-Muslims paying their tax were treated in humiliating ways. You know, they had to, I don't know, wear humiliating clothing or they had to kneel and hand over the money or what have you. So exactly how that second verse plays out um, depended very much on interpretation. There is another text. It's probably not as early as it claims to be. Um, it claims to be from the time of the second caliph, uh, Umar, uh, it was also important in Islamic thought as a blueprint of the treatment for the treatment of dhimmis. Uh, more than one version of it exists. So again, it's not the most reliable text, but it was certainly accepted um, among Muslims as a genuine text, whatever we might think of it historically. And here is a little excerpt from it, from it the Pact of Umar. Uh, it's recorded in Atabari, who you can see is much, much later than Umar. Umar is uh, 634 to 644, uh, he ruled. Uh, so Atabari's history, which is terribly well known, um, records this. Uh, and this is the agreement that Umar is said to have made with the inhabitants of Jerusalem, who, as you remember, were all Christians because they hadn't allowed Jews in. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, this is the guarantee granted the inhabitants of, inhabitants of Elia by the servant of God, Umar, commander of the faithful. He grants them the surety of their persons, their goods, their churches, their crosses, whether these are in a good or bad condition, and the cult in general, cult here meaning the, the form of their worship. Their churches will not be expropriated for residences nor destroyed. They and their annexes will suffer no harm, and the same will be true of their crosses and their goods. No constraint will be imposed upon them in the matter of religion, and no one of them will be annoyed. No Jew will be authorized to live in Jerusalem with them. Now, this isn't a Muslim interest. This is a Christian interest. The, Jews, the Christians don't want the Jews in Jerusalem. So they, the Muslims are saying to the Christians, fine, we won't force you to accept Jews in Jerusalem if you don't want them. The inhabitants of Jerusalem will pay the poll tax in the same manner as those in other cities. It will be left to them to expel from their city the Byzantines, the, the, the Arabic word is Rum, which is basically the Romans, and the brigands, i.e. people who uh, don't accept Muslim rule. Those of the latter who leave will have safe conduct. Those who wish to stay will be authorized to do so on condition of paying the same poll tax as the residents of Elia. Remember again that Elia is the name for Jerusalem. At this point, uh, the Romans gave it the name Elia Capitolina. The peasants who are present in the city can remain and pay the poll tax on the same basis as the inhabitants of Elia, or if they prefer, they can leave with the Byzantines and return to their families. They will not be taxed until they have gathered their harvest. This writing is placed under the guarantee of God and the protection, the zimma of the prophet, of the caliphs and the believers, on condition that the inhabitants of Elia pay, pay the poll tax that is incumbent upon them. That's quite a liberal document. It says we're not going to convert you and you can have all your religious buildings and carry your religion on. You do have to pay the tax. So the, again, this is quite a, uh, certainly in terms of the um, 
certainly the seventh century and even the ninth century, this is a liberal document. Uh, there were many, many um, kingdoms and of various types at the time that would not have issued anything as generous as this. So, and this was seen as a model. So in general, apart from some slightly more unusual times like when there was false conversion, the Emis were allowed to practice their religion. There were certain conditions. Uh, they had a measure of communal autonomy. They were allowed to keep bishops and organize themselves or rabbis and organize their own communities. And they were guaranteed personal safety and security of property in return for paying the jizya poll tax and acknowledging Muslim supremacy. Now, taxation from the, from the point of view of the Zimis who came under Muslim rule was not a big deal because they'd already been paying taxes to earlier regimes. So it's not as though Byzantine peasants and inhabitants of Jerusalem didn't pay tax to the Byzantine rulers. Of course they did. So it's more a continuation of an earlier practice. In some cases, the taxes they were paying to the Muslims were lower than what they had been paying earlier. From the point of view of the Muslim conquerors, uh, the payment of a tax was proof of the Zimis subjection to them. So everyone was happy. There were various restrictions and legal disabilities on Dhimmis. Uh, they often couldn't carry weapons. Uh, they couldn't give testimony in courts in cases involving Muslims, for instance. Those are very typical disabilities. But most of, the, have, most of these disabilities had a social and symbolic character, uh, character and weren't so practical. Uh, they were designed, you could say, in a long-term process to make it unappealing to retain a religion that wasn't Islam. So they definitely discouraged but um, not in the fiercest manner ever. And there was some violent and repressive persecution, but it was atypical generally. The limitations on the rights of them also made them quite vulnerable to mob violence. If that got whisked up uh, was by, by local rulers or local conditions, then they, they were definitely a much more vulnerable position. And occasionally you had local rulers who just didn't like Zimis and had a go at them. Uh, so, Generally speaking, uh, the historian uh, Bernard Lewis has summed up the position and said uh, their position under Islam was very much easier than that of non-Christians or even heretical Christians in medieval Europe. And it is generally uh, thought by historians that Jews under Muslim rule had a better time. It wasn't always ideal and it depended when and where. But overall, they did better than Jews under Christian rule. Uh, you may remember that Jews under Christian rule had huge limitations on their occupations. They weren't allowed to join uh, craft guilds and they were gradually in many European societies were forced into money lending because everything else was closed off for them. Uh, Jews in Islamic societies were often craftsmen and merchants and uh, generally did better economically. That was uh, one of the advantages. Uh, however, the Dhimmi, both Jews and Christians, in uh, Muslim countries uh, did not, uh, couldn't have high position in the army. And uh, generally it was Muslims who dominated agriculture. So trade and business again was left to the Mis, both Christians and Jews. And you could sum it up and say the Muslim attitude to the Mis was one of eh, contempt, uh, but rather, rather than hate or fear or envy. And it wasn't usually expressed in ethnic or racial terms. There was none of this talk about, you know, Jews being the children of Satan, like, like as in Christian Europe. Uh, it was just, you know, they're Jews, they're stupid. Um, but once people converted, there wasn't a, a lingering prejudice. And again, that's different from Christian Europe, where Jews, even when they converted to Christianity, never stopped being Jews. Uh, they were never thought of as proper Christians. So um, if we move on from that Little, little sideways look at what happened to non-Muslims under Muslim rule, we can also see uh, three major crises in the High Middle Ages. And we'll take these one by one. And the first is the arrival of the Turks. Now, the Turks didn't come from Turkey. The Turks came from somewhere up here in Central Asia. There were lots and lots of Turkic-speaking peoples in Central Asia. Uh, some of them migrated eastwards, some of them migrated westwards, and they tended to be nomadic warriors rather like the Arabs had been actually at the beginning of Islam. Uh, they first encountered Islam in the ninth century when 3,000 Turkic slaves were bought by the Abbasid Caliph al-Mutasim to form the core of a new army. And in the year 836, he built a new city, Samara, which is in modern Iraq. I think it's south of Baghdad, I'm not absolutely sure, uh, so that they could live there. It was a, it was a sort of a slave soldier city. The idea was that uh, slave soldiers would be completely loyal to the caliph because they wouldn't have any local ties or any familial ties. Uh, 
uh, they were also very easy to obtain because the Turkic tribes back in Central Asia were perfectly happy to sell off prisoners they took in their own personal inter-tribal feuds. And they were also quite happy to sell off unwanted children. Uh, and so naturally the Caliphs converted these slaves to Islam and were very, very widely used indeed. They, they supplied uh, standing armies for a lot of the Caliphs. And it wasn't very long before these uh, huge numbers of slave soldiers realized that they actually were the ones with the power. And in many cases, they began to set themselves up as, as guardians, in inverted commas, of the rulers. And sometimes they just directly seize power themselves. So for instance, the founder of the Tulanid dynasty that ruled Egypt between 868 and 905, um, Ibn Tulun, was the son of a slave called Tulun. I mean, he probably started life as a slave himself. Uh, and his father Tulun had been sent to the Caliph as part of some tribute paid by the governor of Bukhara. And you remember Bukhara is right up here. Uh, and Tulun did very well. He became chief of the Caliph's private guard. And his son, Ibn Tulun, was sent off from Baghdad down to Egypt in the year 868. And he consolidated his his uh, power base there. And in 874, he decided that he was independent of the Caliph and he was ruler of the country. And variations of that story occurred repeatedly. Perhaps the most famous example is the Mamluk or Mamluk dynasty of Egypt, which ruled from about 1260 down to 1517. So that constantly um, dynasties were arising that were powered by uh, fairly recently converted Turkic slaves who had been imported as, as uh, just as you know, cannon fodder. Well, this is slightly before cannons. But Turks didn't always achieve power by slavery. A notable exception was the Seljuk or Saljuk dynasty. Uh, the Seljuk clan of Turkey was a, it's basically a sort of little independent unit of a tribe. It entered Iran as mercenary soldiers, in other words, not slave soldiers, they, they got paid. Uh, they were hired by the local dynasty, the, the Samanids, who were a Sunni dynasty who'd taken control of most of Iran. And uh, the Samanids collapsed in the year 999 and the Seljuks just filled the vacuum. And in 1055, their leader, Togril Beg, marched into Baghdad, defeated the dynasty there, which was actually also Turkic, uh, who'd been controlling the caliphate for a century and announced uh, that they were saving Sunni Islam. And the Seljuks, acting in the name of the Caliph, they didn't claim the Caliphate for themselves, but they just kept the Caliph as a puppet. Uh, they built and ruled, ruled the largest Islamic empire since the height of the Abbasid dynasty. And you can see here, the yellow on the map, that is basically the Seljuk empire. It was vast, absolutely vast. Went right the way down, included the holy sites of Islam in Arabia, right down what is now Israel, a uh, lot of present day Turkey. You can see the Byzantine Empire is still surviving. This was the Christian Byzantine Empire, it's just about surviving then. But uh, the orange bit is where the Seljuks got around 1100 and they acquired quite a bit more territory there. And you can see they had the whole area of what is now Iraq, Iran, um, up into Afghanistan. So uh, it was an enormous, enormous empire. Uh, it didn't last terribly long, about 120 years, which is not very long for an empire, but it embodied two major trends at the time, the triumph of Sunni Islam, which was doing much better than Shiite Islam in most places, and also the domination of these Turkic tribes in political and military matters. And uh, I've just made a little table here, we won't go through it, of the major Turkish dynasties. Uh, we talked about the Seljuks, uh, they are an interesting example because they were not slaves, they were free. Uh, we talked about the Tulunids, uh, who were a slave dynasty and controlled Egypt, but there were also the Ghaznavids, uh, who controlled Afghanistan, Eastern Iran, the um, obviously named slave dynasty, who controlled northern India for, for the better part of 90 years, and later on the Mamluks, who take uh, power in Egypt. So again, some of these names you may know from, uh, from history because Mamluks and Seljuks turn up a lot. Uh, by the 14th century, the, the Turks, uh, recently, fairly recently converted, seemed to be in control everywhere in the Islamic world. And some uh, Muslims who weren't Turkish actually regarded them as a divine blessing. So the great North African historian and polymath Ibn Khaldun uh, recorded his feelings about it in, in his Kitab al Iman, the Book of Evidence. He says, it was by the grace of God, glory be to him, that he came to the rescue of the true faith by reviving its last breath and restoring in Egypt the unity of the Muslims, guarding his order and defending his ramparts 
This he did by sending to them of this Turkish people and out of its mighty and numerous tribes, guardian Amirs, and Amir means a prince, and devoted defenders who are imported as slaves from the lands of heathendom to the lands of Islam. The status of slavery is indeed a blessing from divine providence, so he was all for it. Um, quite possibly because it, it provides stability. Um, when, when these Turkish uh, empires got set up, they, they usually lasted quite a while and did provide uh, peace and good government in their rules, in, in their realms. That was threat number one, which you can see was a threat that was sort of tamed. Uh, the conquerors are converted to Islam, and they, they may be a different people, but uh, you know they, they seem to be ruling the Islamic world okay. The next threat came from the West, and that was a Christian threat. That was the Crusades. Now, the Crusades themselves started in the year 1096. They were launched by the Pope with the cooperation of uh, various of the rulers of Western Europe. And the Crusades were not just a drive to gain back the Holy Land from the infidel. There were all sorts of complex factors behind the Crusades uh, that didn't have very much to do with the Muslim world. For instance, uh, the fact there wasn't a lot of war going on in Europe and there were a lot of unemployed, uh, heavily armed warrior nobility who were just you know, spoiling for a fight. Uh, there were other factors as well. Uh, the Muslims certainly didn't have an, any understanding of the Crusaders' motivations. As far as the Muslims saw it, here was a mass invasion of non-Muslims from the West attacking lands that had been Muslim for about 400 years by that stage. And uh, to the Muslims, the Crusaders were the Frange or the Franks. Uh, it was a rather derogatory term that conveyed the meanings of infidel, barbarian and Northern European. And they had a very low opinion of these uncivilized people from the West who, who had disgusting habits and didn't wash enough. That was one of the great Muslim uh, charges against the, the Crusaders. They were dirty in their personal habits. Um, and completely uncivilized. It was all about, you know, lumbering around in thick wool and, and huge, enormous iron swords, while Muslims were used to a culture where people wore silk and, and had graceful, beautiful damascened light blades that were very sharp. Uh, so they were two very, very different cultures. Uh, apart from the unique religious and political motivations of the Crusades, uh, the two sides probably were pretty evenly matched in their expectations of the struggle, because after all, the Muslims were simultaneously attacking, or had been attacking, the Byzantine Empire. Um, and it, it was sort of fair game. You know, the Muslims were sort of pushing west and trying to take over lands that were Christian, and here are the Christians pushing east and trying to take over lands that are Muslim. So I don't think anyone at the time saw this as something absolutely unforgivable. And, and, and it just, you know, much more nationalist terms, like how dare they come here and take our land. So even though the concept of invasion was perfectly familiar to the Muslims, uh, the, their main objection, I think, was the Crusaders, well, apart from losing land, was that, 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 that this in totally inferior culture was daring to raise its head and, and, and try and squash their very, very advanced culture. And they honestly had quite a point. The other thing was the Crusaders were absolutely awful when they captured cities. They had a habit of massacring everyone with no distinction at all. They massacred Muslims, Jews, and other Christians uh, in the cities they captured. And quite rightly, the Muslims thought that was totally barbaric. That wasn't something they did. And in 1097, a Crusader army defeated a Seljuk, Turkish army at Nicaea, which is in um, modern Turkey. They then advanced to Edessa, which you can see on this map, it's uh, in Syria. And uh, they set up a kingdom there, and then they went down to Antioch, also in modern Syria, and they took that in the year 1098. A little bit later in 1098, in the winter, they captured another Syrian city that's not on the map, Marat al-Numan, and they did that by promising an amnesty to its inhabitants. And then they proceeded to massacre every last one of them. And when they took Jerusalem down here in 1099, they did exactly the same thing and massacred all the inhabitants. Uh, the Jews had fought on the side of the Muslims to resist the Crusaders. I think by this stage, everyone knew what happened when the Crusaders took a city, they just killed you all. And all the local Christians who were Greek speaking Eastern Rite Christians were, cu were killed by the Latin Christians, the Western Christians who didn't really regard their fellow Christians as Christians at all. Uh, and there are accounts of the taking of Jerusalem that speak of the, the horses, the Crusaders' horses wading up to their knees in, in flowing blood, which is probably an exaggeration, but uh, massacres definitely happened on the Crusader watch at, uh, with no question at all. I don't think anyone would dispute that. Uh, 
So rather as when the Arabs made their original conquest in the seventh century, the Crusaders arrived at a time where politics and uh, rivalry between Muslim states was at its height. So just as the Arab invaders of the seventh century took advantage of the weakness of the Byzantine Empire and the Persian army, so the Crusader invasions of the 11th, 12th centuries um, came at a time where the Seljuk leadership was very busy with conflicts in the east of their empire, over, right over towards Afghanistan. And the Fatimid dynasty down here in Egypt, which was a Shiite dynasty, had its own problems. Uh, this is when the Nizari Ismailis split off in 1090. I think we talked about them last time. They founded their own state up here in northern Syria and Iraq. And as a result, the Crusaders managed to set up these four little states, the Kingdom of Jerusalem down here, the Principality of Antioch, and the two counties, the County of Tripoli and the County of Edessa. And they lasted a while, but not, not tremendously long. I've, I've put the dates up here so you can see. Um, the last one was uh, to fall was the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which fell in 1291. Uh, but you can see the County of Edessa had already gone by 1159. So these were not long term developments. That surprisingly to us today, contemporary Muslims don't seem to have been particularly outraged at the Crusader invasion. We have a very few contemporary Muslim accounts, but again, they tend to focus on, they're sort of quite resigned about it, and they, they, they focus on their disgust at the disgusting, dirty Crusaders, and uh, and also they, they often express indignation at the brutality of the Crusaders. And we have one little bit from Osama ibn Munkid, who is a contemporary historian, and is writing about his experience, his personal experience with Crusaders. When one comes to recount cases regarding the Franks, the Crusaders, he cannot but glorify God, exalted is he, and sanctify him. For he sees them, the Crusaders, as animals, possessing the virtues of courage and fighting, but nothing else. Just as animals have only the virtues of strength and carrying loads. I shall now give you some instances of their doings and their curious mentality. And the army of King Folk, son of Folk, who was king of Jerusalem for a while, was a Frankish reverend knight who had just arrived from their land in order to make the holy pilgrimage, that would be to the Christian sites in Jerusalem, and then return home. He was of my intimate fellowship and kept such constant comp company with him that he began to call me my brother. Between us were mutual bonds of amity and friendship. When he resolved to return by sea to his homeland, he said to me, my brother, I am leaving for my country, and I want you to send with me thy son. My son, who was then 14 years old, was at that time in my company, to our country, where he can see the knights and learn wisdom and chivalry. When he returns, he will be like a wise man. This was a generous offer of the crusader, and it was actually a contemporary practice for noblemen to place their young male children with of important members of the nobility to be trained up in their houses. They would start as pages and they would learn all the arts of, um, of uh, jousting and fighting. And they would essentially be uh, boarded out at a nobleman's uh, castle in order to understand the, the final rules of chivalry and to be given a good military training. So this is a generous offer by the Crusader standard. This is saying, you know, I'll take your son and educate him the way I would anyone from my society. Uh, however, <laughs> it's, it's clear that uh, Osama ibn Munkid didn't really see it that way. Thus there fell upon my ears words which would never come out of the head of a sensible man. For even if my son were to be taken captive, his captivity could not bring him a worse misfortune than carrying him into the lands of the Franks. However, he's a very tactful man. I said to the man, by thy life, this has exactly been my idea. But the only thing that prevented me from carrying it out was the fact that his grandmother, my mother, is so fond of him and did not this time let him come out with me until she exacted an oath from me to the effect that I would return him to her. Thereupon he asked, is thy mother still alive? Yes, I replied. Well, he said, do not disobey her. So he gets out of this embarrassing situation by pretending that his mum had said, you know, don't let my grandson out of your sight. He's not to go anywhere at all. Um, I rather like the idea that you know, they, they could be friends. Uh, they got on very well. The Frankish knight makes this generous offer to a Muslim, and the Muslim just cannot believe he's been asked this, but still has the courtesy and the tact to uh, not just blurt out his horror, but to uh, dream up some really good excuse so he doesn't offend the Frankish knight's sensibilities. 
uh, for him it would have been, uh, I suppose, a bit like if I don't know some early um, some early uh, settler in 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 uh, Canada had made friends with with one of the native uh, 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 tribesmen, and the native tribesmen had said, "Oh, why don't you send your kid to us, and we'll bring him up and make him into a proper warrior?" And you could imagine, you know, European settlers would have gone, "Good God, no! In a heathen society? Are you crazy? Absolutely not!" Uh, so you can see the Muslim writer here has a very strong sense of his superiority. You can also see that Muslims and Christians are, by this stage, um, you know, accepting the fact that there is a Christian state here, and are socially friendly. So that's a little bit different from perhaps some of today's rhetoric. And uh, Ibn Munkid adds, everyone who is a fresh emigrant from these Frankish lands is ruder in character than those who have become acclimatized and have held long associations with the Muslims. In other words, if they live here for a while, they get much more civilized. But when they first come, they're very, very crude indeed. And actually, uh, the Crusaders did take back a lot of Islamic culture uh, to Europe, including, um, rumour has it, uh, handkerchiefs to wipe your nose with rather than blowing your nose on your sleeve, and other sort of uh, appurtenances of civilization. So the Cru Crusaders actually constructed a feudal society there, but they probably were never the majority in the area. Uh, the Israeli historians Joshua Prava and Ben Vinisti estimate the Crusaders were maybe 15-25% of the total population. Not everyone agrees with that, but that's one estimate. And they did actually adopt local Muslim culture very rapidly. There were quite a lot of marriages of local women. And they brought a lot of it back to Europe. They brought back scientific knowledge. They brought back uh, language elements. This may be when words like uh, alcohol, alkali, various other things come from Arabic get taken back to Europe. Uh, but they left very little part behind in the area, apart from ruined fortresses, some of which are very beautiful. And they didn't have a huge impact on Muslim culture. And Daniel Brown, uh, I historian of uh, modern times, uh, thumbs up his analysis of the Crusader episode with the words, the memories of the Crusades were like a time bomb, time bomb, however, which was destined to go off in the future. At the time, they were a minor irritation, not a real threat at all. And in our day, uh, the rhetoric of Europe as the Crusades or, or, or Western civilization as a crusading attack on Islam is quite prevalent, and uh, it wasn't probably like that at the time. Uh, again, that's somewhat changed uh, from what was probably the historical reality. Okay, much worse, much more scary was the threat from the East, and that was the Mongol invasions. Now, they did reach Europe, but they didn't have anything like the impact on the European and Christian world as they did on the Muslim world, which was closer to where the Mongols came from. Uh, again, they came from Central Asia. Uh, they're related to the earlier Turkic tribes who went west. And uh, they were, again, they were nomadic warriors. Every male was a trained warrior. Uh, they used horses. They were extremely, extremely mobile and very fast. And their empire had grown from a sort of militaristic confederation of tribes that had originally been designed to raid the neighboring agricultural societies and use their lands as pasture for their own flocks. Uh, the very famous Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan was probably the way it was pronounced, uh, consolidated this confederation in 1206. And it was inevitable they were then going to look outside the heartland where they'd started, they were going to invade. And they went east and devastated China and they went west, which is our part of the story. The Mongols, rather like the Crusaders, were utterly merciless, and they wiped out entire cities that resisted them and then just razed the cities to the ground, and nothing like the Mongols had really ever been seen before. They were just so many of them, and they were just so ruthless, and they were just so unstoppable. Uh, and one of the pretexts for the invasion happened in the early 1200s. In 1218, the governor of Khwarazm Shah, which is up sort of towards uh, Afghanistan, he, it was a little Muslim state, Actually, I think it was you know, a bit nearer than modern Uzbekistan, sort of in the north of Afghanistan to Uzbekistan. Um, the governor there massacred a party of 450 merchants. They happened to be Muslim merchants, so this was a Muslim massacring 450 merchants, because he thought they were Mongol spies. And Genghis Khan sent three envoys to demand reparations for this. Presumably, you know, he'd, be, they, he'd given them safe conduct and they were probably carrying trade products he was interested in. And the very foolish governor killed one of Genghis Khan's envoys and sent the other two back without their beards. Well, that was a stupid thing to do. And in 1219, the Mongols invaded 
and they pillaged the whole area of Transoxanian forest sciences, it's again northeast Iran up to, to Afghanistan, uh, seeking revenge. And a Persian historian of the time, Giovanni, records the surrender of the what is now Iranian city of Merv in uh, 11, uh, sorry, in 1221. And he says, the Mongols ordered that apart from 400 artisans, whom they specified and selected from among the men, and some children, girls and boys, who they bore off into captivity, the whole population, including the women and children, should be killed, and no one, whether woman or man, be spurred. The people of Merv were then distributed among the soldiers and levies of the Mongols, and in short, to each man was allotted the execution of three or four hundred persons. They came, they sacked, they burnt, they slew, they plundered, and they departed. And this story just went on. Uh, the Mongols destroyed the walls in the citadel of Merv, set the mosque on fire. Then they moved on to the city of Balkh, which is in North Afghanistan now, Nishapur, which is Northeast Iran now. Uh, and they've just reduced those cities too. And Mongol brutality was quite logical. Uh, cities that surrendered immediately were spared, but any attack on a Mongol or any resistance brought fierce retaliation. And you can imagine people surrendering like mad if you knew that you know, if you didn't surrender, you, you would all be killed. Uh, that rather encouraged people to surrender. And from the Mongol point of view, the world was divided into herds, that was the agricultural population, and herdsmen, that was them. And herds were to be owned and controlled and milked by the herdsmen, so their, their basic ideology was uh, pretty grim. There was a bit of a lull for 30 years while they had a little fight among themselves, but then their attention turned back to the Islamic lands. And the great Khan, the head of all the Mongols, sent his brother Hulagu to invade. Uh, he did want to get rid of the um, independent uh, Nizari Ismaili state that was round about here in Iraq and sort of uh, uh, northern Syria. So that was his prime, uh, his prime mission. But he also wanted to make the Caliph in Baghdad submit to the Mongols. And he also seems to be interested in setting up his own kingdom. And in 1256, the Mongols wiped out the Nizari Ismaili state. And, and they moved on, and in 1258, they attacked Iraq. Uh, the Caliph resisted, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, they killed the Caliph, they moved on to Syria in 1260. They captured the Muslim kingdoms of Aleppo and Damascus. Uh, Damascus. Um, the Crusaders, unforgivably perhaps, joined forces with the Mongols. Uh, the Pope excommunicated them for that, the uh, Crusader Prince of Antioch. The Mongols were heading for Egypt, but their armies were held, halted by the Egyptian Mamluk dynasty at the Battle of Ain Jalut, which should be better known. That was in Israel. Um, it's quite near Nazareth, up in the north. And that was one of the decisive battles of the Middle Ages. And that's, that was in 1260, and that stopped the Mongols. In addition, uh, the succession of the Mongol Empire fell vacant, and Hulagu rushed back home to try and get it for himself. Um, and the, the other factor was that there wasn't a lot of pasture land around in northern Syria. It's very dry to support the huge herds the Mongols brought with them. So they thought it wasn't much, much use, really. So from 1260, the Near East was divided between the Mamluk dynasty in Egypt and Syria, uh, who invented their own caliphate as the original caliphate, caliphate had gone, and the Mongols. And the Mongols gradually settled down as what's called the Ilkhanid Empire in Persian Iraq. That lasted until 1335. And they gradually disintegrated into smaller states. But the impact of the Mongol invasions was immense. First of all, entire cities had been destroyed, plus the high culture of Baghdad all went at this point. Estimates of the number of people killed do run into the millions. They have been disputed, but clearly a lot of people were killed. Uh, some areas did escape. Southern Iran was not actually invaded by the Mongols. Uh, Egypt, they didn't get that far in North Africa. Some cities like Bukhara uh, did recover quite quickly uh, and were flourishing a few decades later, but other things were more fragile and couldn't be rebuilt. And the agriculture of Khorasan in northeast Iran was permanently damaged. It's a dry area and it was irrigated by means of underground canals called kanats, which are still there. But the system requires constant upkeep and the system broke down and the Kanats fell into disuse and the Khorasan became a very barren area, which it still is. So the Mongols seriously disrupted economic life in Iran and in Central Asia. Now, they have been blamed for blighting Islamic intellectual life and causing a rise in conservatism, a sort of retrenchment in the Islamic world. But actually, um, rec more recent investigations have shown that Islam actually was pretty resilient. 
uh, especially when you look at what happened after the Arab conquest five centuries earlier. Um, the, the Arabs had preserved their language, their religion, and their sense of roots, but the Mongols didn't. Uh, they very quickly converted to Islam. Uh, they abandoned their earlier religion, which was some form of shamanism, and some of them were also Tibetan Buddhists. And in 1295, the ruler Ghazan Khan converted to Sunni Islam. Uh, you might have heard of the Golden Horde. That was the Mongol army that invaded Russia. They rapidly lost their Mongol identity and they became quite sort of Turkified. They followed their predecessors and adopted their administrative and, Turk uh, and basically Turkish system. And the whole thing led to actually quite an important renewal of Islamic culture. And it wasn't so hard for the Mongols to become Muslim because like the early Arabs, they were originally a nomadic warrior people and Islam wasn't very hard for them to adapt to. It didn't make any specially difficult to demands of their rulers. They could still fight and expand their territory as long as that was in the name of Islam and, um, and it was against you know, a bad government, that was fine. And a lot of non-Mongol Muslim intellectuals like the historian Giovanni actually ended up working for the new conquerors as they had with the Turkish dynasties. And even though the destruction of the caliphate was all down to the Mongols, it was a bit symbolic because by this point, the caliph in Baghdad didn't really have a lot of power. He was a bit of a puppet being controlled by others. So, you know, that wasn't the end of the world either. And Islamic theology, Islamic law, Islamic philosophy, the mystical tradition, the tradition of uh, Sufism, some of which we'll talk about in later uh, sessions, all carried on. It didn't stop any of that. And there were some pretty brilliant figures in the years fairly soon after the Mongol invasions. So the most famous, perhaps, uh, Islamic poet, Rumi, Jalal al-Din Rumi, who died in 1273, lived right after the conquest. The important religious reformer, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, who, uh, whose thought influenced the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia, and we'll have to talk about him more. Uh, he was active in Syria until he died in 1328. Ibn Khaldun, who he mentioned as the great polymath and historian and uh, was around in 1406. And Islam continued to spread notably to East Bengal, today's Bangladesh in the 14th century and to Indonesia in the 15th century. And as it spread, it constantly evolved because it took on aspects of local cultures as well. So our last, uh, after our three threats, the, the, the Turks, the Crusaders and the Mongols, and I think the Mongols were the worst, will look at a sort of resurrection or a rebirth, uh, what are called the three gunpowder empires that arose in the 16th century. They're almost they're very different. And they, this really is the, you could say, the sort of underlyings of a lot of modern history too. So we need to know about them. And this is the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish based empire here in red, the Safavid Empire in what is now Iran, and the Mughal Empire in what is now India, so we'll do them in order. The Ottomans, again, like uh, some of the Turkic tribes before them, they've yet another clan of Turkish warriors, the Osmanli, from hence, uh, from this name Osman comes Ottoman. I don't quite know how the S changed into a T. But in the year 1453, an epic year, they finally con uh, conquered Constantinople, today's Istanbul, which was the very last fragment remaining of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire had shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. We saw on the previous map how the Seljuks had taken over more and more territory. And the last bit of it to fall was Constantinople in 1453. So that was a very significant date for Europe because it meant that that was it. The last of the Eastern Christian Empire had disappeared. So that definitely opened the way for Islamic rule to expand into Southern Europe, as you can see it did. Uh, the conquerors had achieved what other Muslims had failed to do for 800 years. There'd been a lot of attacks on the Byzantine Empire and attacks on Constantinople. It's the first, obviously, the first time it fell. Uh, their leader, Mehmed, earned the title of the conquerors. So you could say the founder, or the founder well, not quite the founder of the dynasty, but one of the first really important person in the dynasty is Mehmed the Conqueror. And his successors consolidated their rule in Anatolia, what's now Turkey, and the Balkans. Uh, they'd started this process in 1299 and in 1517 their leader Selim, known as Selim the Inexorable or Selim the Grim, actually defeated the Mamluks in Syria and the Ottomans had an empire of their own right down here into Egypt, out of North Africa, down into Arabia that more or less covered the whole territory and 
parts beyond of the original Byzantine Empire. So they really, really expanded enormously there. And it was a great threat to Europe. In 1529, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the emperor's army actually besieged Vienna, the very famous siege of Vienna in 1529. And nobody knew at the time how far they were going to go. And an important uh, part of the Ottoman system, which I want to pick out because this is important for what we'll be talking about next week when we get into modern times, uh, they integrated the religious scholars, the ulama, which just basically means those who know, into the state bureaucracy. And the scholars formed their own hierarchy within the ruling class, and they were formally part of the army, which is a little bit weird, but that's how they did it. It was a pyramidal system. There was the Shaykh al-Islam, the leader of Islam at the top, and he had equal status with the king's vizier, his right-hand man. And below him were two Qadha Askis, judge of the army. And below there were 43 Qadis, think Dayan, religious judges, uh, divided into three levels. And they elaborated this system. There were a variety of grades of muftis and prayer leaders and preachers in the lower grades of 12 grades altogether. And to advance, you had to get certificates, you had to pass exams as you passed up the hierarchy. Uh, like other members of the ruling class, they didn't pay taxes, and uniquely they could pass on their wealth to their descendants. Other soldiers or other members of the army, ordinary members of the army, uh, lost all their wealth at death because they were formerly slaves of the rulers, so they couldn't pass on things. So you can imagine people were desperate to get their sons into the ulama because it meant you know, possible advancement plus inheritance and no taxes. Uh, the ulama also supervised the great religious endowments, the waqfs. A waqf is a bit like a hekdesh in um, Judaism. Uh, people leave money for setting up charitable housing or a fund for this or that. And uh, over the course of time, many of these endowments become extremely wealthy. And of course, somebody has to administer them. So the ulama administered the waqfs, and probably some of them got quite rich off the back of them too. And there were things like that. Uh, there were religious foundations in Europe as well, uh, Christian ones, some of which still exist. Uh, so not surprisingly, the ulama in the Ottoman Empire were very, very conservative. The system was set up to, to get them to the top and it was very, very rewarding. They didn't want change. And that gets very important when the Islamic world meets the modern world in the 19th and 20th centuries. So the entrenched bureaucratic conservative nature of the Ottoman clergy is a, ulama is a very important factor. And we'll come back to that next week. What about the second uh, empire, the Safavid Empire? Well, while the uh, Ottomans were expanding into Europe, a rival empire was emerging here, what was Persia or Iran. In the year 1501, uh, Ismail, who was the leader of a radical Shiite Sufi order, uh, conquered the city of Tabriz in northern Iran, and he set himself up as ruler, and he declared his version of Sh uh, Shiism, the Twelver form of Shiism that we discussed last week, to be the state religion, and thus he founded the Safavid Empire. And he gradually conquered all the other small states that made up Iran at the time by 1511. And he seems rather unusually to have tried to exterminate Sunni Islam in his realm. Now, Iran was predominantly Sunni at this point. You know, he was the odd one out, but he tried very, very hard to squash the Sunnis, and he was actually very successful. Uh, he enforced ritual cursing of the first three caliphs as usurpers. Do you remember that Sunni and Shia disagree about the four first caliphs, the rightly guided caliphs, according to Sunni Islam? Uh, three of them absolutely not okay, according to the Shiites, only number four, Ali, the son-in-law of the prophet, being okay by Shiite thought. So there was ritual cursing of the first three caliphs. Uh, he disbanded, uh, there, are, there are both Sunni and Shiite forms of Sufism, the mystical trend in Islam. He disbanded the Sunni ones. Uh, they, they had sort of uh, tabikas, which are a little bit like monasteries, but without the celibacy. And he seized their assets. Uh, he faced the Sunni uh, scholars, the ulama, with the choice of conversion, death, or exile. And he imported Shiite scholars from elsewhere to replace them. And that resulted in the almost complete predominance of Shiism in Iran that we know today. There are very, very few Sunnis in Iran. And it's because of the 16th century development. Uh, Iran, as I say, was Sunni before then. Um, Shiite centers, uh, well, there's still a lot in Iraq, but they probably were much, uh, much more Shiite than Iran was at the time. Now, uh, they might have spread further, but the Ottomans decisively defeated the Safavids in 1514. And in turn, the, the Ottomans started persecuting Shiites in their territories, a sort of, you know, tit for tat. Uh, 
And for the very first time, there was a sharp geographical divide between Sunni and Shia. So the Ottoman Empire was Sunni and the Safavid Empire was Shia. And both sides took care to eject members of the other form of Islam. Before it had been much more of a patchwork. Um, it varied much more. And their intellectual cultures of the two empires started going very much in different directions. Uh, also, uh, popular forms of religion were affected. And in the Safavid Empire, Sufism, as it had been in many places, was the most dominant form of religion day to day. People were, were enthusiastic Sufis, they were myst uh, followed mystical leaders. Uh, but that got pushed out and it was place, replaced with other forms of popular Shiite piety, including the passion plays that are still uh, performed in Iran and in Shiite communities elsewhere, uh, commemorating the death of Ali's sons at the Battle of Karbala. Uh, that includes things like self-flagellation and processions and what have you. Uh, and also, uh, hatred of Sunnis was encouraged and correspondingly in Sunni areas, hatred of Shiites was again encouraged. So these are quite new elements. The last empire we're going to look at is the Mughal Empire here in India. Um, that was founded again by the descendant of Mongols. Uh, one of the Mongols who was already uh, Muslim, in, this is, we're talking um, the 14th century, was uh, Timur. We know him in the West as Tamburlaine, uh, but Timurileng or Timur the Lame uh, was his original name. Uh, he had founded a huge empire, the Timurid Empire, uh, and was uh, and had various descendants, including a young man called Babur. And Babur was forced out of his homeland somewhere in Uzbekistan, uh, went down to Kabul, and turned his attention to India. And in 1526, he decisively defeated the Muslim rulers of Delhi at the Battle of Panipat, and he founded what we know as the Mughal Empire, which was just about the whole of India, maybe far the very, very bottom bit of India. Uh, and the Mughal Empire is a whole story in itself that we don't have time for, very interesting, um, with superb, superb art tradition. So Babur's grandson, Akbar, who lived almost exactly the same time as Queen Elizabeth I of, of, of England, uh, 1556 to 1605 are Akbar's dates, uh, extended this empire from its northern beginnings right down towards the south. And Akbar was a most unusual person. He was fascinated by religion and uh, very pluralistic. And he tried to invent his own religion that would be acceptable to everyone. He called it uh, Din al-Ilahi, the, the religion of God. Uh, and he used to have huge discussions at court with scholars from all sorts of different religions, not just Muslims. And uh, under his rule, he abolished the poll tax on non-Muslims. Uh, he stopped the practice of converting Hindu girls to Islam for marriage. Um, he also revoked the death penalty for apostasy from Islam, and he paid for the building of Hindu temples, all of which was quite unusual in a Muslim emperor. Um, his grandson, by the way, Shah Jahan, is the bloke who, who uh, built the Taj Mahal at Agra. Yeah. Uh, and Akbar's great-grandson, Aurangzeb, was the last of the great Mughal empires before the British turned up and started dismantling the Mughal empire. Uh, but Aurangzeb was not at all uh, tolerant, was much more narrow and conventional and restored a lot of the non-friendly uh, policies uh, that Akbar had, had relaxed or dispensed with altogether. So we've now got the scene, if you like, for what happens in the 19th, 20th centuries, which we'll look at next week. But um, I'm very happy to take questions. I'm going to try and see if I can see the chat. Let's knit through the chat and see what people have been asking. Um, isn't just yet a contrast to the half a shekel that's expected only from those whose heart inclines to generosity? Uh, yes, there were taxes and dues that Muslims had to pay. Um, there are various things there. Uh, there, is, um, there are two types of taxes. Muslims have to pay, I think it's 10% of their income to charity for charitable purposes. And uh, they also would have had, as it were, civil taxes that you had to pay to the ruler, land taxes and things like that. Um, the half a shekel was interpreted by the rabbis as not just being from people who felt like paying it, but all adult males. Uh, so rabbinically, it's compulsory on uh, adult male Jews. Uh, what about the justice? Uh, their voices have no power compared to the Muslims. Whose voices? Uh, the Dhimis. Uh, well, actually, they could operate their own legal uh, systems. Uh, but in, yes, definitely in um, in Muslim courts, definitely uh, Zimis had, had a much subordinate 
uh, position and their evidence wasn't always accepted. Uh, that was the same also in uh, Christian Europe. Um, so yes, no, it was, it, was, it was not a modern society. So no, there was no idea of everyone had the same rights. What about Shmolana Gid's military office? Yes, that was fascinating. This is, uh, we're talking Spain here, uh, under the Umayyad dynasty in Spain, uh, Shmolana Gid, Arju, uh, rose to be chief minister and head of the army in, I think it's about the 10, about the thousands, not the golden dates there. Um, yes, and, and did very well, though came to, uh, I think, fell from favor. It was very much dependent on the local king. Uh, so again, it depended enormously who the local ruler was, what his attitude to the Dhimmi population was. And there were those who were quite favorable and those were totally opposed. So you were very much at the mercy of well, whoever the ruler was. So that would have been the true of uh, minorities throughout the world at this point. There's a difference between the treatment of Jews in Islam, Middle East, Africa, and Christian Europe, one of philosophy of practicality. I, Europe had less percentage of population non-Christians in the Muslim world, non-Muslim. Uh, I think it's, it's theological. Um, it's much more theological. Uh, under the Christianized Roman Empire, Judaism was the only permitted religion, apart from Christianity, of course. Uh, so technically, Muslims, well, they weren't around at this point, but later on, um, uh, there would have been a major theological problem with non Christian, non-Jewish populations in Europe. They would have been there illegally. Uh, so, and there was a very complicated theological attitude towards Jews because of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. In, in one sense, Jews were necessary to Christianity. For Christians, they proved the truth of Christianity because uh, you could say Judaism's holy books had been uh, to some extent reinterpreted or through the word would be hijacked by Christianity. So you needed Jews around. Uh, this was uh, Jerome's idea that Jews should be maintained in a position of misery to show that they were wrong, Christians were right. Nothing like that existed in the Islamic world. It wasn't part of the theological view. So um, Jews were not necessary to Islam in the way that Jews were necessary to Christianity, uh, theologically and philosophically speaking. So it's, it is a different history and it works out differently. Um, again, it's very difficult to make large overriding generalizations because at different times and places, and we often forget this, there were times in Europe where Jews got on fine with their neighbors, because uh, we tend to focus on the times when they didn't get on fine with their neighbors, um, which were, you know, horrible. There's no defense for it at all, also in the Islamic world. But it's quite a complicated situation, and often it does depend on time and place, and what's going on then, who the local ruler is, and what the local ruler's attitudes are. And that is true of the Muslim world as well. But there is less of a theological imperative to show the Jews that they're wrong in Islam. So that may account. Um, there's some really good books comparing, um, comparing this, um, having a look. Um, uh, ooh, what's the one? Um, Under Cross and Crescent by, oh boy, I've got it in my shelves and I can't see it. I can't remember the author now, uh, but you could probably Google it under Cross and Crescent. And uh, that's a really good comparison with the fate of Jews under Islam and under Christianity. Uh, were Muslims more civilized? Yes, much more, much, much more. They had access to Greek philosophy. They had access, uh, 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 there'd been huge amounts of translation both in Spain and in Baghdad of works of classical antiquity into Arabic. Um, so they knew far more about Aristotle and Plato and Muslim philosophy was flourishing at this point. Uh, in Western Europe, it was at a much earlier stage and was, was Christian. And uh, they hadn't really quite discovered the, uh, the, the legacy of the ancient world. Uh, there's a 12th century Renaissance in Western Europe where they start uh, getting it. And then there's the full Renaissance where, where more things come to light. But um, materially, um, in terms of philosophy, in terms of music, in terms of high culture, the Muslim world was streets ahead of the Christian world at this time, far more advanced civilization. Um, and yes, and the Muslims knew it. And they sort of looked down on, the, on these crude, hulking tranks sort of from their point of view, you know, hairy, smelly men who grunted. Uh, they didn't think much of them. Um, they, and uh, there, was a, there was a very sophisticated culture of manners. Uh, some of the ideas came back via the Crusaders and influenced the much later European tradition of chivalry at court and troubadours and things like this. So some of that actually was a result of bringing back Islamic elements of civilization. Um, any similar stories for a Frank Knight and the Muslim originating from Muslim areas? I'm not quite sure what that means because that was, well, it was from a, a Muslim area taken over from the Christian area. 
Uh, they're not a lot of contemporary things, but most of the, certainly most of the Muslim stories we have do tend to uh, look down their noses at these crude crusaders. Uh, conversely, there's quite a lot of excitement in, in uh, crusader stories about importing all these things like wonderful silk that's totally unknown in the West and uh, textiles and uh, glassware and all sorts of things that people bring bringing back and got very excited about. Uh, a certain class of knights are said to thought of the Hashishins as an order to work with by some legends. Uh, yes, with the Hashishin, that's the Nazari Ismailis, it's always difficult to separate legend from truth. Um, really, really hard to know. Um, again, are they around during the Crusades? Yes, they are. Um, a lot of the, the legends about the old man of the mountains and this, this association with marijuana is, is probably legendary, but they were a real political force. Yeah, I don't really know very much about crusader Hachashin interaction. I imagine it was not friendly. Why do you say it was uh, higher? They were just warriors in the local population, the Muslims are the ones who had better civilization. Well, by this time, um, five or six, you know, four or five hundred years after the original Arab invasions, you have a, a very complicated and, and syncretic civilization in which Muslim elements, and local elements, are combined to make something new. Uh, just as European civilization was also affected by uh, Muslim civilization uh, later on, and uh, say so it's very difficult. Um, civilizations don't exist with walls around them. Um, if you look at Judaism, the amount. Uh, I mean, if you look at uh, Rambam and what he owes to Islamic philosophy is enormous. Uh, and we have evidence. He read, he read uh, Arabic commentaries on Aristotle and Plato. We're not too sure he read Aristotle it himself, but he certainly read the commentaries on it. And that influenced his ideas, about, which he then brought into Jewish philosophy. So at the time, there was far more development in most areas in Muslim civilization. But that did feed back into Europe. Uh, it also fed back from the work of translators in Spain, which also was another huge, huge source of knowledge about philosophy and medicine was another thing. Medicine was far more developed in the Muslim world at this stage. And um, it did, it, it, it influenced European civilization and pushed that into new areas. And this is what civilizations do. They impact on each other all the time. The Mongols have a religion. Yes, they were some, talk, most of them were mostly some talk of shamanistic religion. Um, uh, some of them were Tibetan Buddhists. I mean, they weren't Tibetan, but they, they, they had the, the form of Buddhism they adopted was Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, will I be discussing religious differences? Yes, well, we've done a bit of that already. We will discuss a little bit as it comes up. Um, probably won't go into it terribly deeply because that would probably require even more sessions, but we will talk about some of it, yeah. Uh, at different points, not different geographies, one religion which was more civilized and other different geographies. Yeah, certain civilizations and villages. Absolutely, it's a, it's a rise and fall. I mean, if you look at China in the Middle Ages, amazing. Um, so she had a form of religious ethnic cleansing, yes, and it was a bit odd in the 16th century. It hadn't really happened before that people tried to make an entire area just Sunni or just Shiite. It might have been horrible to local Shiites if you were Sunni, or it might have been horrible to local Sunnis if you were Shiite and ruled the area. You, but this really seems, in the person, particularly in the Safavid area, which sparked it off, it seems to have been a form of, I don't want them here anymore, I'm throwing them out. And that was a bit unusual. Uh, there's also a practice of setting aside 10 to 20 percent of income for tzedakah. Yes, um, it's not ten dollars in Islam. It's uh, it's uh, ten percent is um, they have uh, two forms. I'm, I'm blanking on the name for the original uh, for the first form. Uh, they also have the term sadaka, which of course is obviously the same as tzedakah, um, which is an optional extra bit. The ten percent of, of is is a mandatory tax that has to go to charitable purposes and that's uh, that's just basic and non-negotiable and if you're from muslim you that's it you have to do it there are all sorts of um there are all sorts of uh online calculators you put in your you know gross income or your net income and it tells you how much you have to pay uh didn't the crusaders also adopt or take local boys to convert them and worse i don't know i that certainly hasn't turned up in history books uh that i have uh turned up a lot of crusaders married local women um, definitely, probably converted them, but again, was that willing or not? Well, you know, were any women married willingly at the time? People were disposed of by their families uh, for advantageous marriage. Is there any connection between the name Odessa and Odessa? No. Um, I'm enjoying it from now. Oh, good. Tremendous. Uh, Cross the It's not Richard Fletcher. No, it's, oh, well, if I can't remember, is it somebody going? Wait, I'll have another quick look. Yeah, I know it's up here because I was using it. Uh, I just can't see it anywhere. It's oh, in the there we are, Crescent of the Cross. Hang on. 
on the cross and crescent. It is Mark R. Cohen. Excellent book. Really, really um, worth reading and a very sort of careful, dispassionate, evidence-based look. Uh, extend the series, please. <laughs> uh, okay, well, you know, see, see what, we, what you feel when you get to the 10th one. You might not want any more. Who knows? But, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's a whole area that um, mostly we, we're, we're very unaware of the... Oh, Alana got it, brilliant. Um, we're very unaware of the achievements of uh, Islamic civilization, which were incredible. Um, the modern period has, has been soured by the whole Middle Eastern um, conflict. Um, it's it's difficult to approach Islam if you're Jewish with a sort of dispassionate, uh, you know. I think we don't feel the same way about Buddhism. Go, oh, God, you know, who cares? Uh, we don't have a lot of interaction, you know. Well, I can look at it. Uh, so it's quite difficult to look at it um, in this in, in as, as dispassionate ways you can. Um, and like I think all human societies, it's definitely not perfect. But I'm not too sure that Jewish society is perfect all the time either. And when I remember some aspects of our uh, our own culture, for instance, the uh, massacring of Samaritans, which we were big on in the second century BCE. And I think most human societies have the potential to behave very, very badly indeed. Uh, and a lot of it is about the way they interpret their religions, because there are usually different ways of interpreting religions. So, uh, stop showing that now. So, um, yes, I think it's, it's, uh, it's quite difficult to single out whole civilizations as evil or bad or good or perfect. Um, any other questions? Has anyone got anything else they want to get on their get off their chest? Oh, and I'm sorry, Raymond. I, I should have repeated the questions before answering them. I am sorry. Um, I will try and remember to do that next time. But in the meantime, I do recommend recommend that. Uh, I also recommend uh, Daniel Brown's book, which I think I put on some of the handouts. Uh, it's a really, really good, quite short introduction and well written and has, uh, again, useful sources that you can pursue particular subjects further. So next week, we'll look at 19th, 20th centuries, more or less you know, where we are today. And uh, again, it's going to be you know, fairly simplified because oh, I can't cover everything, but we'll try, try, I'll do my best to give you a sort of a, a, an impression of what the landscape of Islam looks like these days. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thank you, of course, like for um, thank you. You know, staying on to address all the questions. And it's, uh, yeah, I think we're all getting a lot from this. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> See you then. Stay safe and dry. Thank you, yes. <laughs>